Good evening, everyone. Um, it's a privilege and honor for me to welcome each and everyone here tonight for this special moment to, um, for my wife's inauguration. Um, as we are here to celebrate Sadina's achievement, we honor God for his blessing in our lives. We truly serve an amazing God. With our walk through life, we grow in a loving relationship with him. We strive to live in a way that's pleasing to him in everything we do. God wants to be part of our life, to be involved in everything we do. God has given each and every one a desire rooted within our hearts to serve him and to know him more. In Philippians 4, verse 6 to 7, we read, Do not worry about anything. Instead, pray about everything. Tell God what you need. What is, in your, what is your heart's desire? And thank him for what he has done. Then you will experience God's peace, which exceeds anything we can understand. His peace will guard your hearts and minds as you live in Christ Jesus. This doesn't mean we can sit back and do nothing. Otherwise, we'll not have occasions like this one. In Ecclesiastes 9 verse 10, we read, Whatever you do, do it well. For when you go to the grave, there will be no work, no planning, no knowledge or wisdom. And this is the reality of life. Whatever we do, do it well. Um, the one thing is certain, we all breathe our last breath. So let's live life to the fullest, to do what we do to the best of our ability. In 1 Peter verse 4 verse 10, God has given each of you a gift from his great variety of spiritual gifts. Use them well to serve one another. Do you have the gift of speaking? Then speak as though God himself was speaking through you. Do you have the gift of helping others? Do it with all the strength and energy that God supplies. Then everything you do will bring glory to God through Jesus Christ. All glory and power to him forever and ever. With the theme of an overflowing cup, I would like to share the following verses with you. John 15, verse 11. I have told you these things so that you will be filled with my joy. Yes, your joy will overflow. Romans 15, verse 13. I pray that God, the source of hope, will fill you completely with joy and peace because you trust in him. Then you will overflow with confident hope through the power of the Holy Spirit. Philippians 1 verse 9, I pray that your love will overflow more and more and that you will keep on growing in knowledge and understanding. Colossians 2 verse 7, let your roots grow down into him 
Let your lives be built on him. Then your faith will grow strong in the truth you were taught, and you will overflow with thankfulness. So with joy, hope, love, and thankfulness, our cup is overflowing. I pray that everyone will have an overflowing cup. And as we overflow, we share God's warmth and loving heart to those around us. For God to speak and awaken their heart's desire within the body of Christ. Lord, as I open the ceremony, we praise and honor your name. Thank you for this opportunity to celebrate Sedina's dedication and hard work. Thank you for your blessing in her life. I pray for your blessing over everyone that is sharing this special moment with us. Amen. Goedenavond, dames en heren. Good evening, ladies and gentlemen. I am Avi Kotse, the Executive Dean of the Faculty of Health Sciences, and it's really an honor to do the welcoming at this inauguration ceremony of Prof. Sedina Kutsia from the Research Entity Quality in Nursing and Midwifery in the Faculty of Health Sciences at the Northwest University. A special word of welcome to Prof. Jeffrey Mopalele, Vice-Chancellor, Research and Innovation, sitting here with a very nice gown at the point, and who is also our main functionary this evening. It is really an honor, Prof. Jeffrey, to once again welcome you at our Friday evening inauguration events, and we are deeply appreciative of your support, loyalty, dedication, friendship, and all the money that you give to this faculty and its staff members. Then also a special word of welcome to Prof. Esther Klopper. This is a beautiful young lady right next to him. The Deputy Vice-Chancellor, Strategy, Global and Corporate Affairs at Stellenbosch University, who have traveled all the way from Stellenbosch to attend this special ceremony. And of course, she was also a previous school director at the School of Nursing here and the promoter of Sedina. A big welcome to retired colleagues of Prof. Sedina, both of them also qualified nurses, Prof. Marlene Villun, the former dean of the Faculty of Health Sciences, and Prof. Minri Greef, the former head of the ethics office at the Northwest University in the Faculty of Health Sciences. So it's not a nursing reunion, it's an inauguration, but it's really a privilege to have some of the top leaders in the nursing environment here tonight, as Sedina is also one of two Sarki chairs in the country. So this makes it quite a special occasion. A warm word of welcome also to uh, Dr. Henny Goede, the Executive Dean of the Faculty of Theology at the Northwest University, to Bram Kutsia, Sedina's husband. Thank you, Bram, for opening the ceremony with scripture reading and prayer, and also for closure afterwards when we are finished. I also welcome members of the Faculty Management Committee of the Faculty of Health Sciences that is in attendance tonight. Prof. Janetta Duplessis, Deputy Dean Research and Innovation. Prof. Alida Herbs, Deputy Dean Teaching and Learning in the Faculty, and Prof. FA USAI, Deputy Dean, Community Engagement and Stakeholder Relations. Then also welcome to Prof. Velma Libbe, the current Research Director in Quality in Nursing and Midwifery. And this is the entity, of course, in which Prof. Sedina conducts her research. Prof. Sandra van Dijk, School Director of the School of Pharmacy. Prof. Sanet Brits, Director of the School of Physiology, Nutrition and Consumer Sciences. Also, a warm word of welcome to Prof. Elmer Deacon, Acting Director of the School of Psychosocial Health. Um, I'm not sure if Dr. Elizabeth Smith is here, Deputy Director of the School of Psychosocial Health on the Mafeking campus. Dr. Elsebi Borman, Deputy Director 
of the School of Nursing on the Potch campus, Ms. Rory Song Machailu, Deputy Director at the School of Nursing on the Mafeking campus, Prof. Anli Moss, Research Director of Physical Activity, Sport and Recreation, Prof. Lesetia Lechwabi, Research Director in the Center of Excellence for Pharmaceutical Sciences, Prof. Rous Aisi, Research Director of the DSI Northwest University Preclinical Drug Development Platform, Prof. Anita Wessels, Research Director or Director in the Center for Pharmaceutical and Biomedical Services, and Prof. Wayne Towers, Head of the Health Sciences Ethics Office for Research Training and Support in the Faculty. A special word of welcome also to the staff members of the School of Nursing who are here tonight and also for the staff members of Quality in Nursing and Midwifery, the research entity. Also welcome to other staff members of the faculty and university. We also have some live streaming tonight and it's also a privilege to welcome everybody who are currently looking at the pro seedings here and who will afterwards also look at this and especially the research collaborators and postgraduate students of Prof. Sedina. Then a very special word of welcome to Prof. Sedina, her family and friends, her family and friends, her sons Andrew and Matthew Kutsia, and her family all the path from Namibia. Our ouders Helmut in Margarit Nobloch and sister Simonai Nobloch for gesels dear Adrian Maritz. A further word of welcome to our school ouders Dries and Mariki Kutsia in our school sister Izet Kutsia. It now gives me great pleasure to introduce you to our special guest of the evening, Prof. Dina Kutsia, and I request that she joins me for introducing her. Sedina Klobel Kutsia was born on 26 October 1982 in Winduk, Namibia, and she is the eldest daughter of Helmut and Marguerite Nobloch. She matriculated in 2002, continuing her education at Northwest University, completing her four-year professional degree as well as a master in nursing science cum laude in 2007 and 2008 respectively. Sedina married Bram Kutsia in 2009, and they have two sons, Andrew and Matthew. In 2010, she completed her PhD study as the youngest nursing doctoral graduate in South Africa. I think she was then, if my calculations is correct, 28 years. 28 years under the promotorship of Professor Klopper, which I have introduced to you. Her PhD research was part of an international collaborative study with nurses from Australia, Japan, Korea, Thailand, the UK, and the USA. She commenced her career as a project manager at Northwest University in 2007 and coordinated several national and international collaborative research projects. In 2012, she was awarded the Sigma Theta Tau International and International Network of Doctoral Education in Nursing, I then postdoctoral fellowship in nursing scholarship, and she completed her postdoctoral training at Western University, London, Ontario, in Canada, under the mentorship of a renowned professor, research professor Ever Lashinger. Sedina was promoted to senior lecturer in 2012, teaching several modules in nursing research, education, management, and general nursing science. She received national recognition in this capacity, being awarded the Excellence in Nursing Education Award by the Nursing Education Association in 2014. Sedina was promoted to Associate Professor on 1 January 2016.
Sedina's so passion has always been research, and she received national and international recognition for her contributions. With National Research Foundation, Y writing in 2016 16, and C writing in 2022, being inaugurated as the youngest fellow of a canopy of nursing in South Africa or ANSA in 2016, and the first person to receive the Emerging Nurse Researcher Award for the Africa region of STTI in 2016. However, the highlight of her career was in 2020 when she was appointed as one of two national research chairs in nursing science within the NRF South Africa Research Chair Initiative, or SARCI. And that is the Albertina Sisulu Research Chair. Her main goal and the goal of a program is of course strengthening and improving the research and innovation capacity of public universities to produce high quality postgraduate students and research and innovative outputs, and this she do in the nursing environment. Sedina was promoted to professor on 1 January 2023. She has supervised, co-supervised nine doctoral and 14 master's degree students to completion and is currently supervising six doctoral and eight master's degree students. She has published 23 articles, most in Scamago Quintile 1 journals, with citations ranging from 10 to 608. She has authored four book chapters and co-authored a book titled, In Our Own Words, Nurses on the Frontline, with Professor Hester Klopper and Jonathan Janssen. Sedina has contributed to more than 25 national and international conferences and webinars including invited keynote and pre-plenary presentations. She has served as a collaborator or co-investigator for seven international multi-country studies and principal investigator for three national projects, having secured funding to the value of close to seven million rand up to now. You will all agree with me that this is truly a remarkable academic record and an excellent achievement. And with this, ladies and gentlemen, we will now proceed to hand over the academic ware to Prof. Sedina and to invite her to deliver, to deliver her inaugural lecture with the title, The Nursing Profession in South Africa, Our Cup Renov, over. Congratulations from my side also, Sedina, and enjoy your presentation. Well done as a young person of such a remarkable output this far. Good evening, ladies and gentlemen. I'm honored today to present to you um, my inaugural lecture titled The Nursing Profession, Our Cup Runneth Over. So I want to take a moment to just, many of you aren't nurses, to just introduce my passion and that is nursing. So just grant me these few slides to just advertise nursing. So there's many reasons I love being a nurse and that I'm passionate, passionate about the nursing profession. So the first thing I love about nursing is that it's a profession of contrast and it's a very broad spectrum. Like nurses fit in anywhere from A to Z and everything in between. So for instance, if you look at the main definitions of nursing, you'll see things like with a heart and the backbone, with art and the science, all ages from the cradle to the grave. We're autonomous and collaborative. Individu we serve individuals and communities, all settings, um, both health promotion, care of the ill, disabled, and dying. So you can see that how contrasting it is, the different things that we serve as nurses. The second thing 
I really love about nursing is that it's a very versatile profession. So currently there's over 104 different internationally recognized nursing careers. So that means once you've finished your bachelor's of nursing, you can already move into different research careers. And then with some postgraduate studies or even just practice-based learning, you can also specialize in these different fields. So what I've presented here to you is just from A to H, the different things that nurses can do. Beyond that, the world is our oyster because we are a scarce skill and you can move anywhere between countries in the world. And even to add to that, you can move anywhere in your practice from being having your own practice to being in an NGO or in a hospital. So that just gives you an idea of, I think nursing as a profession uniquely can provide all these opportunities. I've yet to see another profession that can do this for their graduates. And finally, nursing is always presented in the media or as in, um, in soap operas as being very meek and mild. And I'm sure I can't see my dean's face now, but he'll be giggling at that, because um, he will know that nurses are nothing but meek and mild. And if you just look at our history and where we come from. So we start with someone like Florence Nightingale, that is the mother of nursing. And we know her for bringing hygiene and sanitation practices. But I wonder if you know that she was also the one to bring statistics into healthcare. She would be the first person to do pie charts and bar graphs showing um, patient outcomes. And then someone like Margaret Sanger, she gave women the right to choose their reproductive health and was the leader in birth control. Then someone like Elizabeth Kenny, which is more in the traditional role. Back in the day when you had um, polio, it was a fatal disease. They would isolate you, they would restrain you, and no one would come near you. She would advocate that in fact, if you gave physical therapy and warm compressions, they would have better outcomes. Then our founder in South Africa, Charlotte Searle, um, she not only made many changes in health education, but I wonder if you know, if you're sitting here today as a woman, a South African woman, that the reason that you can vote is largely attributed to her. Then Henrietta Stockdale, she put us on the map, not only in South Africa, but globally, being the first person to allow us to register our nurses and to begin formal education in South Africa. Then I have to mention Albertina Sisula, in whose name I have the chair. And she was a nurse in Joburg Hospital and seeing the utter terrible circumstances that the mothers gave birth in, she would become a politician and an advocate and one of the main contributors to the Freedom Charter. Then very recently, if you think this is just age old people, very recently, Rebecca Kozelinski, she gave the voice to the voiceless and developed an app for people that were speech impaired so they could um, discuss or at least mention their basic needs. Then we know caregivers, innovators, advocates, theorists, humanitarians, negotiators, problem solvers, and leaders. So what I want to tell you is that nurses are really led by a meaning and a purpose and nothing gets in their way once they're wanting to bring that change or advocate for that change. So then I hope that after these three slides, if anything tonight you can take away, you have a much broader view and appreciation for nurses. And I'm sure you'll agree that our cup is full when we think of nurses and all they contribute to the health, healthcare sector. But then it is true that we are in the media for negative things and the healthcare sector challenges we have are severe. So the most recent presidential health summit highlighted on the 4th of May 2023 that the main problems we are facing is staffing shortages, infrastructure and resource problems, corruption, political interference and poor governance, substandard care and poor patient experiences in hospitals. This has not changed much from the original commission in 2018, where some of these main issues were also highlighted there. So my focus tonight will really be on staffing shortages and how my research fits into that. So we know that staffing shortages, they look at mainly four factors that contribute to staffing shortages. But 56% of all healthcare providers in South Africa are nurses. 30 million global shortage of nurses is what we currently predict. And within South Africa, we have a range of 26 to 62,000. Almost 50% of our nurses are over the age of 50 years and older. We have decreasing entrance, increased demands, 
and then our nurse outcomes. So the poorer the nurse outcomes, the more likely they are to leave, and the poorer our quality of care. So then again, this is where my focus lies, and I focus mainly on nurse outcomes. But I'm sure now you'll understand that our cup gets filled with very negative aspects. And this mostly comes from the outside, and nurses must cope in these circumstances and still give the best quality of care. Sorry, colleagues, as I'm looking at you, I want to please invite you to open wine and have an, a snack while I present, please. That was the plan. And then I want to tell you where I went from here. This is now really where my research focuses. And this is what I've been busy with for 17 years, if any of my friends and family want to know what's been keeping me busy. So in 2007, I would focus on compassion fatigue. So compassion fatigue is something I still research today, and it's the aspect that's closest to my heart. And that is about a disengagement the nurse feels with the patient, and from there, they're not able to show the compassion that they want to, and there's an unmet need within the patient, and then not the satisfaction in the nurse to see a good outcome. So I would develop a concept analysis, which will remain probably always my most cited research paper, as we were the first to define it. Prof Klopper was my supervisor then as well. And in my postdoc, I would go on to develop a theoretical framework, a nomological network, and now with my postdoc, we have validated the instrument and begun intervention studies. So I just a backstory of why I chose compassion fatigue is, I, if you ask any first year nurse why they become a nurse, they're gonna tell you because I want to care for people. And I also felt that, and round about in my third year, I remember experience where there was a, a girl younger than me dying of cancer. And with compassion fatigue, you still check all the boxes, you give all the care that's necessary. But even though I felt in my heart to sit there that night, I couldn't, and a few hours later she passed away. And that would become a question in my heart of why I couldn't stay there, why I resisted to be there, to do more than what was just required. And that would begin my study on compassion fatigue. Um, oh, from there, I would study many nurse outcomes. So you can see nurse outcomes are looking at satisfaction with work, relationships with work, productivity and effectiveness, health and well-being of nurses. And then I would dedicate much of my time looking at all these different nurse outcomes listed. I won't go through all of them. And I would come to the eventual conclusion that there's only three things that influence nurse outcomes. The one is the patient, the one is personal factors of the nurse, and then practice environment factors. So much of my studies until that point had been focusing on nurse outcomes and how to improve their resilience and how to improve their coping skills. But I would learn that focusing on the nurse itself is actually a negative thing because it's actually the environment that very much influences how nurses perceive um, patient care and satisfaction. So it's very much like this cup. I was struggling against trying to get the negative outcomes out, but they would pour in quicker than you can fix it. So there would become a major turn in my career when, um, as a project manager in Prof Klopper's office, I'd be invited to be involved in the registered nurse forecast. This was this, um, led by Linda Aiken, who did the study in America, and it'd be conducted in Europe, in 12 European countries. And then Prof Klopper got us negotiated to have uh, observer status. And this would be the first time I would be involved in this international study. And at that point, we only conducted the study in six provinces because ethical clearance took a while. And the team at that time was um, Renal Pretorius and Pietro Bester and Wilma Tenham and led by Prof Klopper. Through that, I would learn something that would forever change my career, and that's called a magnet-recognized hospital. So just as a brief overview quickly, a magnet-recognized hospital means this is a hospital that has motivated staff that feel valued and have good outcomes, which as a result, they'll have good patient outcomes, and which as a result, they'll have good financial um, productivity and they stand above the rest. Now, you have to be accredited to be a magnet hospital. This is an American structure, and you go through intense screening to become a magnet-recognized hospital, and they also attract the most staff and have the best patient outcomes and business profitability. So from the magnet hospitals, Eileen Lake would develop the practice environment scale, which I have used in my research ever since. And I want you to please to pay attention to these five things because they'll repeat several times. 
She has five aspects that make a practice environment. So the one is staffing and resource adequacy, collegial relations, nurse participation, foundations of quality care, managers' ability, leadership, and support. So those five things, when they're in place, makes a positive practice environment, and that gives good nurse outcomes. So from there, my program of research would be established, and this is always the three things I would look through, look at in my entire career. So always focusing on nurse outcomes, but specifically, no longer trying to do interventions with a nurse in herself, but looking at the practice environment. And then I'd add patient outcomes for the funding part of that, because it's much easier to get funding if you're going to change patient quality of care and safety. In 2012, we would prove that as a first um, um, developing country that indeed, even by us, the practice environment had the biggest effect above even nurse to patient ratios. And then in 2019, uh, 22 countries, including South Africa, with all these hospitals, nurses and patients involved, they prove throughout the globe that indeed it is the practice of our environment above anything else that improves nurse and patient outcomes. And our study was included in that. So from there, it was set in my mind. We can't do any research if we don't look at the practice environment. So within the RN4 course, we'd only looked at the medical and surgical intensive care units. And from there, I'd look at community nursing, psychiatry, midwifery, and nursing education, and each time get the same results. So then I became interested, if I look at the practice environment and those five aspects, which of it is the most important? And I come to the conclusion, there's a practice environment, leadership, management, and support of nurses, and then appreciation, support, and acknowledgement of nurses. So once you focus on the practice environment, if you can develop the leadership, management, and support of nurses, and improve the appreciation, support, and acknowledgement of nurses, you'll have even better nurse outcomes. And I'd realize that is the focus to have, is no longer to try and improve the nurse outcomes by changing the nurse, but to totally change what you're inputting into the nurse. Now I would like to take just an opportunity to look at the practice environment in academia and how I have achieved what I have at the Northwest University. So these are two very recent publications showing also in academia the most important thing is the practice environment for job satisfaction and intention to leave. So I'm going to go through each of the subscales now and just show some appreciation for the people that have gotten me where I am today. So I start with the same first slide and we look at staffing and resources. And I've tried to invite everybody on this list to be here today because without these people, I would not be able to stand here today. So the administrative and financial support always has to go first because without them, it's impossible to do anything. Um, I've had been blessed with two project managers while I've done the Sochi and they work just as hard as me, and they pray for me and keep my hands up, and then my left hand and my right hand, and that's Anal and Monika. Then Statistical Consultation Service, Prof. Surya and Eric, and I've put Alvina there because she's been helping me so much this year with cleaning data. But Prof. Surya has been with me since my PhD, and she joined us this evening and officially retires at the end of this year. I still haven't let that settle in my heart because I don't know what I'll do without her. And then NW Research Support, um, MP, Johan, and Heide. Um, I've had grants since 2009, and they've been there every step of the way. They keep me on the short and narrow, always. Ethics Office, um, Wayne, Prof. Minri, Pietra, Caroline is here as well. She's the yellow pages of the Ethics Office. Well, she always knows everything. And then the library services as well. And then I've put a butterfly here on the corner, and there's a very specific reason for that. Lizette Grobler loved butterflies, and we lost her in this year, and I just wanted to give a special recognition as well. Great, then we move on to collegial relations. So this is the first photo I have of working at the school in 2007. At that stage, we were just one school and that tiny staff complement. Now this last picture is at the research day. That's not even all our staff. That's probably just the people who really, really love research. But now we are three schools over three campuses. And what's changed between those pictures is the first picture, all of those people in that picture have mentored me in some way. And now in the last picture, I can also say that I've been 
got an opportunity to mentor others, and it's one of my favorite things to do. And I thank the staff that are here today and the influence they've also had on my career and in my personal life. Then I move on to the third subscale, and that's participation in organizational affairs. So the Northwest University does a splendid job of getting us involved from early in our careers, first in management of the school, then the faculty, then the institution, and through my work in the office of Prof Klopper, I've also had much national and international exposure. So I don't want to go through every one of these, but one I would like to highlight especially is Fundisa, which is a forum of university nursing deans in South Africa. So I started working there from their startup and over five years. And the first meeting I attended, I don't know if you, if you know nurses, they use a lot of acronyms. So I went to this meeting and I didn't understand anything. They were talking acronyms all the time. I remember having a massive headache because I had to take notes. But anyway, I, over five years I grew, and I'm, there was amazing people, Prof. Bruce, Prof. Mulder, Prof. Fanamava, legends that really influenced my life and my career choices. And what I saw of these nurses, they're all university nursing deans. When they came together, they could really change policy. So for instance, the clinical grant we have today is due to them. But I also saw that they mentioned many things we'd have problems with that no one paid attention to that we really do struggle with today. Then the fourth one, the fourth subscale, is foundations for quality outcomes. There's three things I really focus on in my career when I look at um, service, and that's outcome data. So although I do some qu qualitative data, my passion lies with quantitative data because I feel like numbers is something that politicians listen to. Um, then also I love developing early career scientists. Um, I've been involved in doctoral and postdocs and also emerging researchers, and there I've worked with Prof. Hanley Moss since 2019, and she's an amazing woman that really just freely gives and really makes sure that emerging researchers don't struggle and take the long path like some of us had to. She's really an amazing, I've learned a lot from her over this time. And then my main focus on leadership, but I will come back to that. And then finally, as you know, leadership, management, and support is the fifth subscale, is the most important thing that directs someone's life or the nurses' lives. And there's four women that I really have to really thank tonight. So I hope I don't get emotional because I can feel it. <laughs> right, so first let me start with Prof. Minri Khriev. I would start my beer in 2003, and she would have this tradition of if you were in the top 10, she would take you out to the fanciest coffee shop in Potchefstroom. And you could take coffee and any slice of cake. And at this hour that we spent with her, she would open our eyes to the world of research and all our opportunities. And pretty much like I did in the beginning, about how wonderful it is to be a nurse. So that would be the first time I would start thinking about research. So thank you, Prof. And she's also in my procession, so I feel really honored. Then Prof. Hester Klopper, you've heard her name several times, can't see her through these flowers, but very prominent in my career. She, would, she actually gave me a timeline that I successfully managed. She told me, before 30, you have to have your doctorate. You have to get the Sarchi chair, and by 40, you have to be a full professor. So I actually did it, now I can rest. <laughs> Um, but really, she gave me so many opportunities, and there's no doubt in my mind that I wouldn't be here today without the opportunities she's granted me. Then I was lucky to do my postdoc with Prof. Heather Lashinger. And if you know Prof. Minri and Prof. Hester, there's one thing they really have in common. They both work nonstop. So Prof. Heather Lashinger would teach me in Canada that I'm not allowed to work on weekends. So she would make sure on Saturdays we'd go into the lake or something. So she would teach me that, but also she was phenomenal in teaching me um, structural equation modeling and a lot of the statistics that I was doing at that stage. And then Prof. Janetta, who is even here tonight, and I know she's really ill, so I appreciate it so much. And Prof. Janetta would play the following role in my life. The Saatchi chair call would come, and we'd have two weeks to develop a big proposal, and at that stage I had a small child, Matthew, he was still tiny, and I read the criteria and I wasn't quite sure. You're, I don't know if I actually match this criteria, and I'd ask around and I got advice, and everyone was like, yeah, I don't know, it's a big risk, and 
but I eventually talked to Prof Jeanette and she was like, don't, you're gonna be sorry one day, just do it. Even if you fail then, then you've done it. So you'd rather wanna try than look back later and not do it. And it's for Prof Jeanette that I actually applied for the Saatchi. And actually got the Saatchi in 2020. So I'm very grateful to her because she also made that investment in my life and opened my eyes to something I didn't see. So from there, I become the Saatchi, and I call the program Synopsis, which is a play on the Greek word which means together and an overview. So I wanted to get an overview of the health system, looking specifically at the quadruple aim of healthcare, and that's the patient, the organization, system, and nurse. So Synopsis then stands for an acronym of Southern African Nurse Organizational Patient and System Outcomes. So there was four projects I conducted within the Saatchi, and this was funded and next year then is my first five years are over. So the first project I would do within this is to replicate the orange forecast study, but really increase the population. So I continued until I had all nine provinces giving me ethical clearance. Um, I increased to four hospital groups. Um, in orange forecast, we could only look at the central just because we had a very t tight timeline because we had to keep up with the Europeans. But in this case, I included central, um, provincial, and district hospitals, and I also included all specialities of nurses. And then in that little corner, you'll see a COVID virus, which we all know very well. And that's just to tell you that in January 2020, I got the Saatchi. We had this big launch. The dean gave me money to have a big launch like this. I was prepared. The speech was done. And then the week before, we went into full lockdown. So, and then it's collecting all of this, doing all of this in COVID time. So let me tell you some of the challenges that I had in this time. So the ethics had to change, obviously, because we couldn't move into the hospitals. So just an overview is we got 18 ethics committees went through my proposal, and this took approximately two years. And that means you, you have to get permission from the different provinces and also the hospitals. Um, we traveled about 15,000 kilometers, and we just would present this project to nurses a thousand million times. And it was largely driven by um, Anal, which was my project manager, and Monika helped a lot with the telephone calls to try and get hold of the CEOs of the hospital that in COVID time would keep changing every three months. It was a new CEO, a new acting, a new, so it was something. And I mean, we did achieve it, and we, I went through all these provinces, and we collected data in all these hospitals. But something I really need to present is opportunities. It's within the Saatchi, first time ever, I had full-time master's students. You can see some of them on these pictures. First time we had full-time PhD students. Um, first time I had a postdoctoral fellows, um, project managers, and then also emerging researchers that could move into the program. And something that was special to me as well is some of these students that I took with. Um, it was the first time they flew. It was the first time they saw the sea. So it is really a special event. So let me give you some of the results from the national study. So this is still not published, so it's hot of the press. So these are just six statistics I'll present to you, and it's what I use a lot in my presentations. The first one I want to highlight to you is 85% of nurses are satisfied with their careers. I'll come back to that in a second. 31% are dissatisfied with their jobs. 43% have high levels of burnout. 25% intend to leave their job. 30% rate the quality of care as fair or poor. And 13% um, see patient safety as fair or poor. Now, the reason I put satisfied, which is the only positive one amongst those, is because we so often hear that nurses are doing nursing, but they don't want to nurse, which is not true. I have not seen in any of the orange forecast data or this one that this is the truth. Nurses love being nurses. They love their career choice. We don't see that they are dissatisfied with it, but there is the practice environment and their jobs that cause them dissatisfaction. So that is just my myth buster for the evening. So when I present to nurses, I usually do it in this form. I'll tell them, because there's always a joke that goes about there were five people in the bar. So I'll go, if we look at the aspects that have been influencing nurse outcomes, we have five 
culprits sit on the seats. We have the practice environment, COVID-19, death and dying, staffing, resources and equipment. So those are the five things that had the most influence on nurses during the COVID period. And um, I would always have them vote. What do they think had the most effect? And you'll be surprised. Every time it will either be staffing or COVID-19. But as my hypothesis has shown you earlier, this is not the truth. Again, the practice environment, most effect on nurse outcomes. You can see up to five times, the better the practice environment, the less likely they're to have burnout. The same can be said about patient outcomes. So when we look at the patient safety, quality of care, it's the same thing with trend we see. Up to six and a half times that patient can manage their care at home, the better the practice environment. Then I told you that my heart's desire was to know out of those factors, which is the one that it, subscale that influences nurses the most. And previously, I could only look at hospitals or districts or small areas, but this was a national study. And indeed, right through, it would be nurse leadership, management, and support that affects all of these outcomes the most. Whereas when you look at patient outcomes, it varies between participation in hospital fairs, which can also be addressed through leadership, and then staffing. So what now? These are then the three areas that I will focus on going forward because we know nursing leadership is the ultimate thing we can focus on. And then nurse participation is a, is a result if you have a good leader because if you see leadership in each person, they will also participate and leadership will improve. But then staffing, I just want to take a sidestep quickly and Prof. Surya has helped me the last two to three weeks and we just wanted to look at what is the staffing in South Africa? So, you know in Australia, we talk about four, four patients to a nurse, and that is their norms. And in America, they have five patients to a nurse, and that is the norms they have there, and they actually fight against it and say it's not evidence-based. So I want to tell you in South Africa, when we take all categories of staff, that's the registered nurse, the enrolled nurse, and the nursing auxiliary, so that's a four-year degree or diploma, a two-year a diploma or the certificate enrolledness assistant, then we are at five, five patients to a nurse. If we take away the nursing assistant and we just have registered nurses and enrolled nurses, we sit with eight patients to a registered nurse or enrolled nurse. That's far beyond the five of America. If I just look at registered nurses, we talk about 14 and a half registered nurse, uh, 14 and a half patients to a registered nurse. So it's almost triple that America complains about. Um, so going forward, my focus in the Saatchi and where we are now, uh, my student that's working on it with me is watching live. We are developing a leadership academy and we're not looking only at managers. We're looking at every single nurse because we believe Every person is a leader and every person can make a difference in their corner. So currently developing a leadership academy, looking at systematic review, developing a prototype, and then also looking at national and international bank benchmarking. But the idea would be to have core modules um, so that everyone in every speciality could do those core modules and then electors for each specific specialization. And that sums up the work that I plan for in the Saatchi, or some of it. But I did have an unplanned turn in the COVID times. And I would watch Prof. Janssen write, have students and teachers write books about their experiences of learning under lockdown and teaching under lockdown. And I would wonder, yo, I wonder what nurses felt like nursing on the front line. And we'd have a call to nurses and over 80 nurses would submit their stories. And we'd select these stories to be presented in this book. And something I want to tell you is that this is probably the highlight of my career. Um, when we did the launch in Cape Town with those five nurses, I don't think there's people that were more heroic to me than those five people. And if I had to summarize the experience and the book and reading the, their narratives, it's they overcame fear, fear in itself, fear of dying, fear of their family dying, and the greatest fear then was to not fulfill their calling. So I would learn through that book that, again, you can see the main five practice environment issues coming up, 
But in addition, what would come up is work-life integration and meaning in work, which I could never have measured before in my studies, but this came forward. And I would realize that when your back is really against the wall and you have nowhere to move, there's three things that are the most important. And that would be three Fs, friends, family, and faith. And that's what these nurses taught me. So allow me a moment to just say thank you to my family and friends. I will not thank them individually. I will not make it. I don't like being emotional. And then in front of 70 people and live streaming. So I have thanked them in the program. They should please read the program and find their picture. But what I can say about them is I have wonderful friends and family. And there's a song about being banks to your river. So I'm always flowing, I'm always chasing something, I'm always wanting to change. I like bringing justice, and they keep me calm, they make me self-care, and they listen to my struggles and give me advice, and these are the people that I really, really hold dear, and that make me who I am. And then your faith, I think, if anyone that knows me knows I like to climb mountains, we one time had a dare to say, if you had an autobiography, what would you title it? And I had a long think about this. And I decided mine would be, the problem with the path is the path. So I don't like following paths. I like to climb my own way. And if I see an injustice, it's immediately like my gears kick into place and I want to change that. But really, this scripture directs my life, and I lift my eyes up to the mountain. Where does my help come from? My help comes from the Lord, the maker of heaven and earth. And then, I'm sure you will agree with me, as the title of my inaugural lecture is that when we look at the nursing profession, our cup truly runs over. And and I, if I can challenge you to one thing, it's try and thank a nurse a day, just anywhere they are, because that drives them. If you, if you can appreciate your nurse, you feel that makes the biggest difference, and that's something anybody can do. And then also, I can also stand here today and say my cup runneth over, and I'm so thankful to everyone that's here and that has joined online, and I thank you for this opportunity. So allow me a moment to just give thanks for this um, Day I've had, um, Prof. Avi Kotze, Prof. Janetta, Prof. Valma, and Dr. Elsevi Borman, they all gave financial contributions to make this event possible. Um, the procession, especially Prof. Marlene, yeah, I really appreciate you being here. Um, Prof. Marlene is a legend, so really. And I thank the procession, the deans and directors for attending the event in their official capacity. Monika, who helped me arrange all of this, and you'll see she has a baby on board and she's been running, so I really appreciate it. Um, Krishna and Hilton at Roots, RS Audiovisual and Sound Squared Productions, Maclays, Yulandi Kutsia from Yulashi Kutsia made this dress for me, and she makes dresses for Miss South Africa, so I feel very honored. Um, Dalian from NW Ceremonies, Braum for doing the opening, my sons Matthew and Andrew, they helped me make the overflowing cup videos, we even had blooper reels and then family and friends for attending the event. So thank you very much. And then a final, I have to say thank you to the NRF. Johan will be very proud of me, um, but if most everything I've done in my career has been funded by the NRF, so I am grateful to them. And then I do have some references. Thank you very much, everyone. <laughs> I really like that picture of it last. Um, I can see how creative you are, uh, Prof. Sedina. Uh, colleagues, um, this is the last item um, of the evening, uh, very short. It's just to congratulate our VIP, 
and special guest who is Professor Sedina Kutsie. So to Professor Sedina, uh, Prof. Avi Kotze and the rest of the deanery of the Faculty of Health Sciences, the directors and staff, the lovely family and friends of Prof. Sedina, distinguished guests, greetings to all of you. Good evening, Dumelang Hoyanant. Ladies and gentlemen, uh, it is with huge honor and great delight to officiate this splendid ceremony on behalf of the Northwest University Management. Prof. Sedina, this is the ceremony that marks the rite of passage as you step into the ranks of full professor. We are utterly pleased for your landmark scholarly achievement. It is a richly deserved milestone and certainly worth celebrating. As you have attested by the valedictory of your inaugural address, it takes many years of dedication and perseverance to attain the status of full professor. Welcome to the professorial ranks. I trust you will enjoy every societal and professional privilege that comes with the rank, make use of it, because it's certainly a special privilege to be a professor. This celebration is also about people who are so dear to us, the pillars of strength and the source of inspiration. These are none other than our families, our friends and co-workers. We are therefore enormously proud when we rejoice in their presence. I'm sure you'll agree with me, ladies and gentlemen, that we can only blossom to our fullest potential if, and only if, the environment is conducive, supportive, and nurturing. And this is exactly our Keith and Keen are providing a nurturing environment for us to reach the greatest highs. This inaugural lecture gives an admirably succinct account of lifetime scholarly work that culminated in Prof. Sidina being a full professor. It is by no means everything about your academic life, Prof. Sidina. Nonetheless, I believe those who are present and those who are listening to this inaugural lecture will not forget this rich and highly informative lecture. It clearly demonstrates the impact of your scholarly activities, and we appreciate and applaud you for that. We often underestimate the impact made by our healthcare workers as part of service to society, especially the nursing profession. Healthcare workers impact our lives in many ways. This is one of the few professions that we can confidently say it is the profession that makes a worthwhile difference in the society by saving lives and improving the quality of lives. They guarantee each one of us access to quality healthcare service as part of fundamental human rights. The nursing profession is always on the front line of healthcare delivery. Whether we have, COVID, we have got COVID-19 or not, they are always there to serve with a smile. The level of devotion is just amazing and heartwarming. So I really think that it is quite fitting that we should always salute their dedication and thank their extraordinary service. You will agree with me that it is highly commendable and inspiring when healthcare workers are able to combine research with demanding service and academic workload that they face every day. 
This is not a small feat. It speaks volumes of the level of dedication, the burning desire to generate knowledge and discover new things. Prof. Sidina, I hope this is a proud moment and joyful moment. Let this ceremony mark the beginning of new chapter of career growth, a chapter that heralds more ground-breaking research and innovations. So good luck with your research agenda. Once again, hearty congratulations for your outstanding achievements. I do hope your scientific adventure will always be rewarding and gratifying. Ladies and gentlemen, it is Friday afternoon, so this is my brief congratulatory message to Prof. Sidina. We thank each one of you for taking time to celebrate with Prof. Sidina and the Northwest University on this special occasion. Good evening and be blessed. I think for the sake who are joining us online, we're just going to present a certificate to Prof. Sedina. It's just a special memento for service to the university, but most importantly, for her outstanding achievement. Thank you. We have come to the end of the official program. <laughs> Evening, everyone, again. So I have the honor of opening and closing. Um, I'm very honored to have Sadina here, and I'm also, I can say, I do say thank you to a nurse every day. <laughs> okay. As we close the ceremony, we know that God is first, that He is, He was, and He will be. We honor His name and thank Him for His blessing. Um, Ecclesiastes 9 verse 7 says, Go ahead, eat your food and joy with gladness. Drink your wine with a happy and joyful heart, for God has already approved what you do. I pray. Lord, we thank you for this evening, for the celebration of a heart's desire and the dedication of a committed individual you have blessed. We ask your guidance and protection in everything we do and strive for in life for it to be pleasing aroma as we honor and serve you. Amen. Um, I ask everyone to please stand while we sing the national anthem, and then please remain standing while we wait for the procession to exit after. <laughs> 